Good morning. All elves and people, please sit down and we'll begin. With number 266 this morning. 266. This morning will be taken from Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the others, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led in the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, wrath, self-ambitions, dissensions, heresies, Envy, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Against such there is none law, no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions of the lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day you bless us with to be here, study your word. Pray that you'll be with us as we go to our classes this morning. Let's have open minds and receptive hearts that we may learn and share with, share it with others. Dear God, thank you so much for sending your son to die on the cross for us so that we may be here today. We pray that you'll be with all the ones not able to be here. Bring them back as soon as possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning again and welcome this morning to Bremen Church of Christ. We're grateful for your presence here on this rainy, rainy winter's morn. Uh, if you are visiting with us, we're glad to have you here as well. We'll dismiss now to our classes with the nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes.
middle school and high school and adult classes as well. If you're in the class in the fellowship hall, come on in there. We're going to have to improvise a little bit. We'll figure it out. Several of you to ask about the notes that you did not have. If I had passed them out and you missed them, no, I hadn't passed them out, so you didn't miss them. And it's all Honey's fault. She's not here, so I can blame her. She should have had that done, <clears throat> but I should have gotten them to her to do them. So, but anyway, that's what you're getting at this point is the rest of the story, chapter chapter two, rest of chapter two. 1 Peter chapter 2 is our one of study at this point. in this letter trying to encourage brethren who are under difficult circumstances to remain faithful to the calling that they have received and accepted, that is to become children of God. He has encouraged them thus far by talking about the position that they occupy. Chapter 1, <clears throat> they are of the elect. They are children of God. They do have that inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away, reserved, ready, awaiting them if they will continue where they are. Obviously, the other side of that coin is if they leave where they are spiritually, then they are leaving behind all of that which they now enjoy. So he's encouraging, encouraging them not to give up because of the position that they occupy. In uh, chapter 2, then, we are talking about the people that they are. We've noted in the first eight verses of chapter 2 that they are a spiritual people. Of course, Paul and <clears throat> Peter agree in what they're writing on this matter as well as other matters, but the point being that once we become children of God, our affections become different. Paul in Colossians chapter 3 said, If you then be, be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And so as Peter begins chapter 2, he talks about certain things that, that they are to lay aside and obviously certain things that they are to strive for, specifically in this section, the Word of God, the milk of the Word, that they can grow thereby. In verses 9 and 10, we talked about the fact that they were a special people. 
when we consider the position that we occupy, the people that we are, spiritual people, uh, special people, and then the other points that we've talked about, it is an encouragement to us, even today, as children of God to remain faithful in His service. He refers to them as a royal priesthood, as a holy nation, as a peculiar people, as a holy priesthood, all of those expressions designed to remind them of how special they are in the eyes of God because of what they've done, because of the position they occupy, because of who they are. Then in verses 11 and 12, and this was primarily our study last week, they are a separated people. He refers to them in these verses as strangers and pilgrims. And we noted that uh, the song that we sing sometime, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And so that's the life that we're living. Not only do we enjoy special blessings here on this earth, as children of God, we have access to all spiritual blessings that are in heavenly places in Christ, but we have something far greater than this world has to offer awaiting us when this life is over. And so he reminds them, don't live just for this life. There are responsibilities in this life, but we're also living in preparation for the life beyond. So. He reminds them, you're strangers, you're pilgrims. This is not your final home, if you please. And so he begs them in that regard. As he says in verse 11, I beseech you, I beg you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, so forth. And so we, we talked about the kind of life that they are to live, a detached life, a disciplined life, a different life in view of what's ahead of them on down the road. Then in our study today, which really contains verses 13 through 24, he talks about that they are to be a submissive people. So they're to be a spiritual people, a special people, a separated people, a submissive people. In the outset, in verses 13 and following, he talks about their submissiveness relative to civil authority. When he says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Well, there's our responsibility as far as citizens of a national system is concerned. We are to be submissive. In verses 13 and the first part of verse 14, he talks about the the various areas of submission to every ordinance of man. Now, we, I think, introduced this idea last week. Does every ordinance mean every ordinance? If we take that at face value... Whatever man decides, we've got to be be submissive to it. But we think back to statements and situations relative to the apostles. Peter and John, for example, were preaching and teaching the gospel of Christ. They were called into question. They were imprisoned. They were told, don't speak anymore in the name of Jesus. That's an ordinance of man. Did they submit to that ordinance? No. Did they violate God's will in not submitting to that ordinance? No. They responded this way. 
we ought to obey God rather than men. Where there is a conflict between the ordinance of man and the will of God, we have to make a choice. Otherwise, like it or don't like it, we are to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man. It's not going to be long until you'll be beginning to think about your taxes and how some of that money is spent and how much you dislike the way it's spent. You can say, well, I'm just not going to pay my taxes. I don't like the way it's spent. I don't agree with the way it's spent, so I'm not going to pay it. What's going to happen? They'll come get you. What's going to happen spiritually? You're going to separate yourself from God by so doing. Because what was it Jesus said during His ministry here? Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. The things that are God's. And so we have to understand what is the ordinance of man, what is the will of God. Where there is no conflict, we are responsible to submit ourselves to the ordinances of men. And uh, so that doesn't always set well. Do you think it set well with these people to whom Peter's writing? Do you think it set well to the people in the, uh, those seven churches of Asia who were being punished right and left under the influence of the Roman government? No. But what was their responsibility? Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. That's the command of God. It's not up to us to decide if we like it or we don't. We can like it or not like it, but whether or not we submit is not left up to us. God has told us that's what we will do. And so to fail to do this would in effect blaspheme the Lord's name by our action. And so as he goes on down through, he explains part of that to us. We have a, a similar section in, in Romans chapter 13. We're not going to take the time to go back and read that section, but it's a parallel passage to what Peter writes right here relative to our subjection to civil government. In verses, latter part of verse 14 and verse 15, he talks about the, the aim of this, uh, this subjection to the ordinances of men. What, what's to be accomplished by it? He says, Unto them who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. It's interesting to note in verse 14 that he says, Really, those who are of government, are sent for what purpose? Two things involved here. And, and Paul makes the same two points in Romans 13. What is their purpose? To punish evildoers. And so whenever the government, whatever that government is, is rendering punishment to those who have violated the law, they're doing it for the very purpose of God. At the same time, to praise them that do well. So if that is their purpose and they are serving their purpose, then what do we have to fear relative to civil government? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. You're out there on the interstate, you're running pretty fast. Around the curve, go over the hill, see a state trooper sitting off to the side. What's the first thing you do? You take your foot off the accelerator and hit the brake. Just follow people down the highway and see what happens. Why? Why do you do that? If you're running the speed limit, what difference does it make who's sitting there and who's not? You don't have to fear. Now, if you're speeding, yeah. You're going to receive a ticket probably. But if you're not speeding, you're not violating the law, there's no, there's no thing for him to punish you. So why do you hit that brake? Conscience bothering you a little bit? 
You rob a bank, what do you expect? Expect them to come after you. Why? You violated the law. You haven't robbed a bank. You see the police coming. You hear the sirens. Do you think, oh, no, they're coming after me? No, you don't think that. Why? Because you've done nothing wrong. That's exactly what Peter's saying right here. As, as children of God, we submit ourselves to the ordinances of men, and we have nothing to fear. But if we do not submit ourselves, they are doing what God, in essence, wants them to do when they punish us. So we have no complaint, no gripe whatsoever. And again, Romans 13 is, is a parallel to that. But in addition to that, he says, this is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So, so one of the points or aims of the of the matter of subjection is by, by our own good conduct, by the way we live our lives, we can silence the ignorant. Now, whether these people are ignorant willfully or otherwise really doesn't matter here, but we can put to silence. Somebody makes a false accusation against you, speaks evil against you, brings charges against you. If you've done nothing wrong, what do you have to fear? You should have nothing to fear. You should have nothing to fear. And then in the due process of things, their ignorance will be silenced. Now, this passage does not indicate that you can live a good enough life that no one will ever say anything bad against you. That's not what this passage teaches. Because there are people who are going to say things against you, whether they're right or whether they're wrong, whether it's out of ignorance or otherwise. People are going to talk about you. People are going to say things against you. But you don't have to fear civil government coming after you, do you? Just because somebody brings a charge against you, just because somebody says something evil against you, you don't have to worry about civil authority coming after you because you're innocent. You've, sub you've subjected yourself to the ordinances of men. So you have nothing to fear, and so in the process of time, that will be silence. This is the best answer to any misrepresentation. That is, a good life. A good life. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 21, Paul writes, Be not overcome of evil or with evil, but do what? overcome evil with good. Somebody speaks evil of you, what are you going to do? See if you can say something a little worse about them? No, no, no. It's not the way the child of God operates. Someone says something evil against you, you're going to get mad, you're going to hold a grudge, you're not going to speak to them for a while? No, no, no. Not the child of God. Not the child of God. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You do good to those people. Do good to those people. Then in verses 16 and 17, he talks about the attitude of uh, subjection. He says, as free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as Servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So we're not to use our freedom in a wrong way. Free. Does that mean we're free to do anything and everything we want to, when we want to, how we want to? No. Because we're free, does that mean we can treat people any way we want to treat them? No. That's not what this freedom's all about. And again, and I don't, uh, yeah, did I put it in the notes? Galatians chapter 5, really the entirety of chapter 5 is a good section parallel to this as Paul writes to the churches of Galatia. They are people who've been set free. Paul uses the word um, uh, liberty as well as Peter in this case. We've been 
liberated. We've been set free. He's already told them in the early part of this chapter, in connection with the position that they occupy, that they were redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. They've been, they've been bought back. They're now free people, free from the bondage of sin. But that doesn't relieve one of responsibility, does it, in that regard? James, in James chapter 1, deals with the same idea. So while we're free from the law of Moses, while we're free from sin, while we're free from fear, we must not be proud, we must not be arrogant at all. Where is there a place for pride and arrogance in the heart of the child of God? It's not there. Man was formed out of what? Dust of the ground. You were redeemed with what? The blood of the Lamb. Now where does that give room for pride and arrogance? When you think about your origin and you think about your redemption, there's absolutely no place for pride and arrogance. One of the greatest books in that regard is the book of Proverbs. Pride goeth before what? A fall. A fall and destruction. So there's just no place for it. Submit yourselves to God. Peter and James both emphasize the point of humility in the life of the child of God. There's no place for pride and arrogance must not use this liberty for fleshly purposes. Again, Galatian, part of Galatians chapter 5 was read to us this morning in the, in the Scripture reading. We noted in the outline that, that freedom always cost. We understand that in, in a lot of respects in life. When we think about the freedom that we enjoy in this country, has there been any cost involved? Oh, yes. There's been the cost of life. There's been the cost of injury. There's been financial costs. There are all kinds of costs involved in our freedom in this country. So we have been made free. But since we're free in this country, that means we can just go and do what we want to, right? No, we have civil government that says there are certain guidelines by which you must live. As a citizen of this country, you have responsibilities in this country. What about a, as a citizen in the kingdom of God? One who's been made free from sin, one who's been taken out of the power of darkness, translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son, Colossians chapter 1, do we have responsibilities? We sure do. And so we noted that in a figure of speech, freedom and responsibility are twin brothers, aren't they? They go together. Can't separate one from the other. So then we noted that rulers are ordained of God, servants of God, for man's good, and therefore we are to submit or subject ourselves to them. But then he goes on to point out in verse 17 there are four things that he talks about their admonitions to these brethren. Honor all the word men there supplied by the translators but the implication is there in this context. Honor all men. Why? God said, Genesis 1, 27, Let us make man how? In our image, after our likeness. Man is made in the image of God. That doesn't mean that mankind is, is going to always act godly. But still, man is made in the image of God. Man has a fleshly side, man has a spiritual side. Flesh and, and soul, flesh and spirit. And so we have to honor all in that regard. 
Love the brotherhood. Who is that? That's the church. It's your church family. In um, 1 Timothy, Paul, in writing to Timothy on that occasion, said, But if I tarry long, that thou mightest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the what? house of God. The word literally there, household. The concept of a family. After all, when we pray to God, we pray how? Our Father, which art in heaven. Jim, you looked up. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought, you had, thought something went through that mind right quick. All right. I used to, I've, a couple of times through the years I have preached, and my dad was a member in that congregation. He followed the grandkids around for several years. And, and Dad always sat a lot like Jim is sitting. He'd always have his head down, looking at his Bible, whatever. I'd be preaching along, and if Dad ever went, I'm like, what did I say? I missed something here. He didn't understand something. So when Jim looked up, that's what I thought about. And my dad was that way. So we have the brotherhood, we have the church, we have the family. Then we have the admonition to fear God. Two simple little words, but how powerful they are when we understand the implications of those two words. Fear God. What is the fear? What does that idea suggest? Respect, awe, reverence. What did you say, Jim? Reverence. Tremendous respect we have. How do we show our respect for God? If we say, yes, I fear God, what do we mean? How do we show that? By obeying Him. By doing what He says. You go to the doctor. You're sick. He prescribes a medication. You go home and you throw that medication up on the shelf or on the cabinet. You say, I'm not taking that stuff. How much respect do you have for the doctor's advice? You don't have any respect for it. So you take the medication. If we do not respect the will of God, we're not going to do the will of God, are we? And so through our obedience to His will, and that's what all of this section is talking about here in our subjection to civil government. By doing that, we show our respect to God. If we disregard civil ordinances, the ordinances of men, so long as they're in harmony with God's will, if we do not obey those, we're not showing reverence and respect for God. You remember the concept in Matthew chapter chapter 25, and I'm sure you do in the judgment scene. When Jesus said what he did to those on the right hand, I was hungry, you fed me, thirsty, you gave me drink, so forth. What was their question? When did we do that for you? And his response was, in so much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, you have done it unto me. So what's he saying right here? Whenever we are submissive to the ordinances of men, what are we doing? In essence, submitting to the ordinance of God, are we not? Because that's what he has told us to do. And when we disregard the ordinances of men, we are disregarding the ordinance of God. Can't do one without the other. So our respect for God is manifest through our respect for civil authority. So there's the, the idea of fearing God. And, of course, Proverbs emphasizes that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. If we, we're going to have respect for God, are we not going to be concerned about what God says? And how are we going to know what He says? Through our reading and studying of His will. 
We're not going to know what He wants of us if we do not do that. Fear God, not man. Well, that goes back to Peter and John. We mentioned a moment ago. What did they say when they were challenged, when they were told not to speak anymore in the name of Christ? We ought to obey God rather than men. Jesus, during His earthly ministry, as He was sending out, He sent out 12, and then a couple of times He sent out groups of 70 to, to spread the message of the nearness of the kingdom of that day. But He said, Fear not them that kill the body. Who is that? That's men. You go out and you begin to, to preach and you begin to spread the word. What's apt to happen? Your life is on the line. What about those brethren that we read about in, in Revelation chapter 6 when John was able to see around the altar of God and he saw the souls of those who had been put to death for the cause of Christ? Who did that to them? Men. But he said, don't fear them that can kill the body, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's where the fear is to be. On one occasion you may recall that some of the Jews believed in Jesus as the Son of God, but they wouldn't confess Him. Why? They were afraid of men. They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. That was their concern. If we, if we confess our faith in Christ, we'll be thrown out of the synagogue. They didn't want that. So they had more respect for men in that regard than they did God. So fear God. Don't fear men. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, the writer of that book says that the whole of man, incidentally, in that section, after the proverb writer had, or rather the writer of Ecclesiastes had, had talked about all of the, the various things in life that he'd tried and all his vanity and vexation of spirit, he comes down and he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is the whole of man. That word duty is supplied by the translators and is rather unfortunate. The writer there is not talking about duty. He's talking about what man is all about. That's why we were created to begin with. That's our purpose here, to fear God and keep His commandments. That's the whole of man. That's our purpose. That's our design. He's not talking about duty there. The whole of man is to fear God, keep His commandments. Then he says, honor the king. So we are to have that Respect for civil authority. We've already talked about that. The supreme authority of that particular day was probably Nero. What kind of a guy was he? Cruel? Ruthless? Honor such a man? Basically what this type statement is suggesting to us is that we honor the position. We don't necessarily honor the individual. We don't necessarily honor the actions of the individual. We honor the position. What is the position? That of civil authority, which has been ordained of God. And so we have to have respect for that authority, that position. It doesn't mean we have to honor a, a ruthless murderer, whatever the case might be but honor, respect the position. So we are to be then the leavening influence in our world. We're saved. We're children of God. That's the position that we occupy. 
But as children of God, we have responsibilities, free from the law of Moses, free from sin, but still obligations, still responsibilities as far as civil government is concerned. So as those who are saved, we are Christianity on display. When people look at us, do they see a true representation of what Christianity is? You know, we just studied through that lengthy series on uh, making Christianity attractive. That's basically what it was all about. Helping us to see our responsibility in, in, in being Christianity on display. Isn't that what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20? When he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but what? Christ liveth in me. Is that what people see when they see me? People who know me, that is my life, my way of life, my conduct, going to show them what living for Christ is all about? Well, that's the way it should be. In the Philippian letter, chapter 1, Paul says, Let your conversation, now what is that? What is conversation? Manner of life. Manner of life. Let your conversation or manner of life be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Well, if our life, if our conduct becomes the gospel of Christ, then it's going to be a true representation of Christianity, is it not? That's the way our life is to be in that regard. Christ living in us. And so in this section with regard to subjection, the first area that he talks about is subjection to civil government. That's a responsibility of the child of God. Don't take that lightly. Don't ignore it. Don't pretend that it's not important. Because when we reject the ordinances of men, we are thereby rejecting the will of God. Because that's what he says. This is the will of God. If we don't do that, we're rejecting the will of God. Next section, verses 18 through 24, he talks about our subjection, servants to masters, and we'll pick up, Lord willing, with that in our next study. Our time's gone for this morning.